Hi, I'm Paul Hopewell. Welcome back to my workshop. This video is part two about my latest acquisition, the South Bend 13 lathe. This addition is about how I made my own straight edges that I need to establish the condition of the slideways and what I went through to achieve my goal. In part one, I mentioned that the slideways on this lathe are showing signs of wear, but how much requires instruments that I just don't have? nor can I justify the cost of a large certified camelback straight edge. I'm sure there are thousands of workshops out there that will loan me theirs for a couple of weeks. Maybe not, but that isn't the end of the world. So I need a straight edge, and I can't afford one. But can I make one? The answer? No. But can I make three? Let's find out. Here's a bit of wood. It's representing my straight edge. Is one edge straight? Yes. Is it precise enough for engineering measurement? Never in a million years. But can I improve it? Yes. Question is, how? Well, I can introduce another straight edge. Putting the two straight edges together will in all probability produce a discrepancy. This error can be measured by using a slither of gauging material like paper or better still a metal feeler gauge. For really small gaps a strong light source can be seen between the two mating edges. Another method for detecting even smaller errors or imperfections is to rub some Prussian blue or engineer's micrometer blue onto one face. Put the two faces together and where the two parts touched each other, some of the ink will have been transferred to the uncoated piece. This shows you what and where the high spots are that need to be removed. In the unlikely event that they match perfectly means that they are at best parallel to each other, not necessarily straight. To add a higher level of accuracy requires a third straight edge and by comparing all three in turn against each other will produce an error that's to be corrected. Without any other form of reference to start with, a little bit of guesswork is required to kick the whole thing off. To produce my straight edge I've purchased three one meter lengths of black steel bar at 100 by 12 millimeter section. And one of the first things I did was to drill a 10mm hole in one end of each one. That's so that I can hang them up out of the way when I've done with them. I've also marked each one for identification purposes. Using a simple light source I established that the edge A and B produced a visible gap mostly to the centre. That means that the ends are touching. With edges B and C, the light source was more evident at the ends. Edges C and A, the light source made it through but in lots of places along the entire length, so to all intents and purposes they are parallel to each other. Using the information gleaned, what would you say is the most likely to be the straightest edge at this stage? By my calculation it's B. C and A, as previously mentioned, are at best parallel. I think it's B because it's concaved against A but convexed against C. While pre-roughing or gashing, I will keep any initial scraping on plate B to a minimum. Before I bought the flat bar, I had to understand that this process is going to take some time, and believe me, it did take quite a lot of time to get the job done. The remainder of this video has been drastically shortened and mostly sped up. Lots of detail has been omitted to keep the video as short as I possibly can. For the initial roughing process I'm going to use my multi-tool with a tungsten carbide grit disc because it's safer than using an angle grinder which is far too aggressive anyway. 
The checking process that I displayed using bits of wood is however a little flawed. In fact it's a little more complex than just comparing plate A against B. In fact it's more like compare B against A then make small adjustments to B by scraping the material off where they touched. Then rotate B through 180 degrees. Recompare the two and then scrape a little more off B where they touched. And so on with C against B and A against C. Then it's back to B against A and so on and so on. In total it's six comparisons and adjustments per full sequence. Using this system all three of these plates will eventually lose their high spots and become equal to each other and therefore as true as they can be. Well that's the plan anyway. You saw earlier that I used chalk on the primary reference surface A. Some of the chalk is transferred to plate B where they touched and were rubbed together. The same process is used throughout. When a large part of the pre-roughing stage was done, chalk was exchanged for engineer's micrometer blue. Behind the primary plate in the vice jaws are two little bits of MDF. They support the secondary plate from wobbling about and kept it fairly true to the primary plate while the rubbing was taken. The MDF of course was replaced with flat steel plate later in the process. I can almost hear many of you asking, will it be accurate? Well, my answer is, they aren't being produced under controlled conditions or with the correct material to be anything other than quite good with an acceptable level of tolerance. Another question you'll probably be asking at this stage, if the straight edges will only be quite good, how on earth do you expect to use them to accurately gauge the bedways? I have inquired about the cost of having the main bedways reground, and the best quote I got was equal to the cost of a small new car. And because I can't afford a pair of roller skates I'm left with two choices. Scrap it, or have a go at improving the bedways myself. That's if the bedways do need fixing. Will I be able to do as good a job as the professionals? Well, no. But when I ask myself, do I think I can make it better than it already is? Then, yes, I do believe I can do this, even with the limited tools to hand. There is one fly in the ointment, that is plate A and B are quite flat when they're laid down, but plate C has a very slight curve towards one end. Coupled with that, none of the plates are flat along the 100mm face either. But you have to remember, I'm not making parallels and I'm not making a flat surface. I'm making a straight edge. Another thing I've also got to contend with is that the table's a bit wobbly, but I'll change this for a more sturdy one later. Before I forget, the primary plate is always the one in the vices on the back row in this case. Just a quick heads up here. After each scraping, especially during the latter part of the scraping process, it's necessary to clean off the burrs generated by the scraping. But because I'm scraping a narrow track it's difficult to keep the stones that I have flat to the top face while pushing the stone along the entire length of the workpiece. Shown here but exaggerated. These little stones I have are old various grade precision stones that are now only used for clearing burrs. I have found that holding the stone on top of the workpiece the stone had a tendency to roll over the top polishing the edges and not removing burrs from the central section. However, if I hold the stone to one side, missing part of the material, then pressing on top of the stone over the centre of the workpiece, the stone never rocked. And when both sides of the workpiece have been deburred, the central section of the workpiece began to flatten out more readily. I actually used old files to do most of my scraping. I do have one proper inch and a quarter tungsten carbide scraper but the tip is almost ready for replacement. 
When sharpened, square edged, and with a small radius along its width, they have a very keen cutting action on steel. But the removal rate is somewhat low. But they're a completely different animal. They're the veritable JCB when it comes to cutting cast iron. Anyway, while scraping steel, I find that to start with, the scraping angle is shallow, as little as 25 degrees. However, as the edge wears off the scraping angle increases, that's until you start skidding off the workpiece, then it's time to resharpen the cutting edge. Just to reiterate, most of the scraping and comparison work has been left out of this video to prevent it going on forever. After many days in the workshop scraping away on this project, I found that the relation between scraping in one direction and then in the other direction changed the way that the steel could be removed. It's the crossed hatched appearance left in the workpiece after each scraping. For instance, scraping in one direction at say about 45 degrees created small vibration ripples across the work. A condition that happens when scraping steel. Not only that, but there's a small amount of hardening that takes place at the same time. So, when passing over the material in the opposite direction, similar marks are left at 90 degrees to each other. All well and good so far, you think, until you start another cut. Then the previous vibration marks start to act a little bit like breaks, constantly hampering what was previously a simple scraping stroke. My fix on this situation was to alter the scraping angle after every run. This helped reduce the jamming effect quite a bit. It also reduced the amount of very small curly unbroken chips forming that can be so difficult to remove with a flat stone. In this part of the video I'm showing you the full sequence. That is B is checked against the primary plate A, then C on plate A, then I rotate both secondary plates around by 180 degrees then check B against A and finally C against A. After each check, I usually use the scraper to remove a little material from the high spots. Next, the primary plate A is changed to plate B. Then I'll compare plate A to B, then C to B. Rotate the secondary plates by 180 degree and check A to B again and then C to B. This process is also continued with plate C as the primary plate. That's the complete sequence. I can't even begin to remember how many times I've done this over the past few weeks. I do know that I can't use my smartphone security at the moment because I've lost my fingerprints. Maybe I ought to rob a bank. Now that's a stupid idea, I can't run anymore. One problem I had was that Engineers Micrometer Blue does a wonderful job of helping identify the hide spots between two surfaces. As the faces become better matched, the Engineers Blue tends to become one thin layer of lubricant. Engineers Blue in its supplied form is very thick and very waxy. Years ago, when I used to grind large diameter conical shafts, I used a certified checking gauge wiped with Engineers Blue to confirm the accuracy. Often the Engineers Blue was too thick to be used out of the tin. A trick I was taught was to add a drip of very thin oil to the blue and work them together. The amount of oil should be enough to be dissolved into the blue and not overpower it. After mixing, wiping the mixture onto the gauge made the steel face appear as a sky blue hue, allowing a finer and more sensitive high spot detection rate. As I got nearer and nearer to finishing these faces, I used thinner layers of blue to identify the finer high spots. So I needed to wipe the part to be tested with a waxy contrasting colour of some sort. 
When I went in the house in search of something to do the job, my wife was deliberately standing between me and her new sewing machine. Can't think why. Anyway, to cut a long story short, I found what I was looking for in the shape of a bright red lipstick. Yes, you heard me. Lipstick. Bright red. Nursing my left eye, I found that the red lipstick left a curious pink hue on the clean surface to be gauged. As a contrasting colour, it worked. To apply it, I used a small cotton dab. What a shame it doesn't show up in the video. At this later stage, I'm trying to prevent any additional influences, like twist. You can see here that I'm clamping the nearby vise tight enough to hold the plate still, as well as support the back plate. But the far side vise is only holding the backing plate in place with almost no clamping pressure. What pressure there is, is provided by the weight of the vise handle. In the final stages of finishing, I simply placed one piece on top of the other and let gravity take over, because rubbing the two components together could inadvertently apply some sort of downward force. This showed up as a lighter high spot in the centre of each plate, necessitating the use of finer scraping techniques. For this I chose to make a pull scraper out of a bit of pipe and after squashing one end, bending it, cutting a slit in it and drilling a hole through, I managed to hold a small piece of tungsten carbide that when ground picked off all the smaller high spots with ease. Without delving into the next video beyond a quick review, I need to establish how straight five surfaces are. These surfaces are this outside face, the inside tailstock face, the flap between the two Vs, this underface and the underface on the far side. Knowing this will help me understand what condition the V-ways are in. But that's a different video. I hope you enjoyed what you've seen. Thanks for watching. Bye for now.